All right, good evening. My name is Hunter, and this is content review for general chemistry students. Tonight we're going over chapters 10 and into 11, uh, starting with phase transitions. We've already looked at some of these concept, concepts in the previous week. We're just going to be getting a little bit more focused here into change states and calculating energy and calculating changes in temperature. A little more practice here. So first, a conceptual question. Heat is added to boiling water. Explain why the temperature of the boiling water does not change. What does change? Where has my little... Well, okay. Talk as I write here. Energy added to the system, or to the water, contributes to boiling, the phase change, until the phase change is complete. Only then can the temp increase. This makes sense to me, but I'm going to try to explain it in a way that um, I'm, I'm going to try to explain it a couple of different ways. If we think of our water molecules all slipping across each other, but still cohering, right? Cohering to each other. When we add, boy, where did my pen controls go? When I add my heat source, this is my fire, okay? When I add my heat source, we are now energizing those particles. When we think about concentration gradients, we're always moving from areas of higher potential to lower potential. The water has a lower energy potential compared to the water molecules that have escaped that state and are now gaseous, right? So we have our water molecules up here that have escaped and, and have, have boiled off already. Another way that this has been explained to me is, you know, temperature is just, again, a, a measure of the average kinetic energy of a substance. And when we have a cup of coffee that is clearly not at boiling temperature, right, we can still see steam. And that steam is those water molecules that have escaped, um, have enough energy to escape that liquid phase. So it's, again, it, it's that average, right? We can say with some confidence that there's no solid water in that cup of coffee, um, but the temperature is high enough that you still have sufficient energy for some of those to get kicked off, but not enough for the whole thing to boil, right? The same thing kind of happens here. The stuff, <laughs> the the water molecules that are in that liquid state are lower energy and are so are, are a really good reservoir for the heat energy that's being added. And it's going to hit that threshold of 100 degrees Celsius before all of it escapes. And then, then the average temperature can rise above that 100 degrees Celsius. So that's the best way that I know to kind of explain that. All right, so carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, was once used as a dry cleaning solvent, but is no longer used because it is carcinogenic. At 57.8 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of carbon tetrachloride is 54 kilopascals, and its enthalpy of vaporization is 33.05 kilojoules per mole. Use this information to estimate the normal boiling point of carbon tetrachloride. So I've, I've written the equation that we need over to the side here, and this should be familiar from last week. Um, we have the Ratio of the partial pressures, um, P2 is the final pressure, P1 is the initial pressure. Delta H of vaporization over R, and then 
uh, inverse T1 over inverse T2. So let's go ahead and look at what values we have already. So we're given an initial temperature. We've got an initial vapor pressure. We have an enthalpy of vaporization. And we're trying to calculate the boiling point, the normal boiling point. So this means we're probably solving for T2. Right? So let's look at P1 first. We've got 54 kilopascals. P2, you have to know that, first you have to know that boiling is not just about temperature, it's also about the uh, gas pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. So the temperature at which the partial pressure of the substance matches atmospheric pressure. So you have to know atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure is around 101.3 kilopascals. T1 we were given, it's 57.8 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals our degrees Kelvin, which would give us 0 0.8, 280.8. T2 is what we're solving for. And then we have R, which we will remember is 8.3145. And that is in joules over mole.kelvin. Your spidey senses should be tingling here because we have similar units, um, but by different factors. Um, actually, no, we don't in this one just yet. Kilopascals, Kelvin, joules. No, we're fine. OK, ignore that. I really would like for that toolbar to come back like it was. OK. We're going to need lots of room for this. Give me just a second. So to start out, I'm just going to rewrite our equation. We have ln p2 over p1 equals delta h vape over R times inverse T1, inverse T2. We're trying to isolate T2. So to do that, we're first going to multiply both sides by R. Gives us R ln P2 over P1, delta H vape, actually, delta H of vaporization. T1 minus inverse T2. We can divide both sides by delta H vape. Gives us R ln P2 over P1 delta H vape equals inverse T1 minus inverse T2. Subtract both sides subtract inverse T1 from both sides. Gives us negative inverse T2. We can get rid of that negative sign by simply multiplying both sides times negative one. And finally, we can get everything right side up by simply, actually, I'm going to keep it down here. So T2 equals negative R ln P2 over P1. Delta H of vaporization 
minus inverse T1 to the negative one power. Negative one just flips everything over, gives us the reciprocal, which is why we're able to solve for T2. Now we just plug in our values into the calculator. We have, <laughs> one second. All right, let's start with R. We're gonna go up here. T2 equals 8.3145. Log P2, gotta actually write it this time. P2 was 101.3 kilopascals to 57.8, yep. Enthalpy of vaporization was 33.05 kilojoules per mole. Yes, we do have to worry about units here. Yeah, because we have kilojoules per mole and we had joules per mole in our R value. So this is times 10 to the negative third. No, times 10 to the third. Going from kilojoules to joules, we divide by, so it's negative three. Would give us joules. Yes. Okay. Joules per mole. Okay. To the negative one. T one was. Two hundred eighty point eight. Two hundred and eighty point eight to the negative one. We should get three hundred and forty nine degrees Kelvin. So three hundred and forty nine degrees Kelvin is the normal boiling point for carbon tetrachloride at normal atmospheric pressure. Man, usually there's a little, ah, I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, moving on. How much heat is required to convert 422 grams of liquid H2O at 23.5 degrees Celsius into steam at 150 degrees Celsius? We can use that MCAT formula again. Heat equals mass times specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. What I want to draw attention to here is we have a phase change, and you'll remember that there's no change in temperature during the phase change. So we have to refer to some tabulated values here, and that is going to be the heat of vaporization um, of liquid water. So really we have a couple of equations to combine here. The total heat equals MC delta T of liquid water plus N the number of moles times enthalpy of vaporization plus MC delta T we'll do gas for the steam, right? So that's our formula. To get our C liquid and C gas, we just have to look those up. And that's gonna be 4.184 and 1.9. And those are in units of joules per gram. We have our mass, that's simple enough. And we need our enthalpy of vaporization equals 40.67 times 10 to the third 
joules per mole. Cool. All right. We can do this as one big long equation, and I think I would like to try. So Q total equals 422 grams times 4.184 times, we're starting at 23.5 and we're going to 100. 100 because that's the boiling point of water. So 100 minus 23.5 summed with, to get to number of moles, we do 422 grams times the molar mass of water is 18.02 grams per mole times the enthalpy of vaporization, we said was 40.67 times 10 to the third. Plus, ooh, we're barely going to have enough room. We will if I move this over. 422 grams. Specific heat was 1.99. And the change in temperature was to 150 degrees up here from the boiling point. Plug that into our calculator. we should get 1,127 kilojoules. Drawing a really quick phase change diagram here. time on the x-axis, temperature on the y-axis. As we were putting energy into the system, temperature was rising in the liquid water until it hit that phase change. Temperature stayed the same. We continued adding energy until we hit that uh, enthalpy of vaporization sufficient enough for those water molecules to escape and go into gas or vapor. If we had additional phase changes in there, like if we were going from solid water to liquid water to gaseous water, you would have additional phase changes in there and you would need to look at your enthalpy of fusion is your energy to go from solid to liquid and enthalpy of vaporization going from liquid to gas. All right, so now we're on to chapter 11. We're talking about solutions, so solids in liquids and how those behave. Predict whether each of the following substances would be more soluble, that is more likely to dissolve, in water, which is a polar solvent, or in a hydrocarbon such as heptane, which is a nonpolar solvent. And all you need to remember here is that like dissolves like. So polar solvents will dissolve polar molecules. Nonpolar solvents will dissolve nonpolar solutes. So vegetable oil is our solute. It is a nonpolar. It has those long hydrocarbon chains and those lipids. So this would be dissolvable in heptane because it is nonpolar. Um, by contrast, isopropyl alcohol is polar. It has these alcohol groups, functional groups. R is representative of our carbon group. You'll learn this when you get into organic chemistry. This is just like another way of representing it, talking about it. This OH likes to engage in hydrogen bonds with other molecules like we were talking about, or like water molecules, um, as we were discussing in a previous week. So starting to integrate some of these concepts into how we see them behave in real life, right? So this one's going to be um, soluble in water. Uh, potassium bromide is ionic. Again, this is a really, really strong um, dipole interaction where 
electrons actually escape from one another, right? To where the components totally dissociate from each other and interact just with those water molecules. And that's actually a really nice segue into this next exercise where we're talking about electrolytes. So consider the solutions present. Which of the following sketches best represents the ions in a solution of, I think this is iron nitrate, yeah. And even if you didn't know for sure, the fact that we're told that this is an aqueous solution is a really strong hint that these are ions in solution. So when we look at our components, we have atomic iron, which would just be chilling by itself. And we have a nitrate, which is nitrogen with three oxygen groups, and it would have some lone pairs attached to it as well, which would give it a charge of negative one. And that's important because metals can have differing charges, right? Um, they're not like those, um, sorry, that's my dog in the background. Um, iron, like a lot of other metals, can have differing levels of charge depending on what it's bonded with, depending on what orbitals are open. And so we can infer what its charge is going to be by looking at what's bonded to it. Which is actually the next question. So first we have to decide which one looks like that. Uh, do we have, this looks like our iron in the middle surrounded by three nitrogen by three nitrate groups. So there's no disassociation happening. Let's say it's not that. Here we have iron and then three nitrate groups all bonded together. The nitrates probably wouldn't want to hang out with each other. They don't have any reason to. There's no um, opposite charge between them. Uh, and as drawn here, those electronegative oxygens would all be butted up against each other, which they don't really like to do. So it's probably not that. Here we have our iron and we have nitrates, and the nitrates are repelling each other because those oxygens are around the periphery. They're all negatively charged. They don't want to touch each other, right? Like the same ends of a magnet want to push apart from each other. So I'm going to go ahead and say that Z uh, is our best representation of iron nitrate dissolved in water. So writing a balanced equation for this, we started with what would originally have been solid. iron nitrate, we add it to water, we end up with iron by itself in aqueous solution, and nitrates by themselves in aqueous solution. Nitrates we know have a negative one charge, there's three of them for every mole of iron, and so our iron had a positive three charge associated with it. More on solubility. Calculate the percent by mass <clears throat> of potassium bromide in a saturated solution of potassium bromide in water at 10 degrees Celsius. So saturated means we cannot add any more potassium bromide and have it dissolve. Um, the, the maximum number of moles are interacting with the maximum number of moles of water. And as we can see, saturation occurs at different percentages at different temperatures, which is kind of interesting. We have solubility in grams solute per 100 grams of water and changes in temperature. We're looking specifically at potassium bromide. Yes. We're looking at potassium bromide at 10 degrees Celsius. So we have zero and 20 halfway in between, would be right about there. 60 grams of potassium bromide will dissolve per 100 grams of H2O. This should be a really easy conversion to do because anything out of 100 allows you to convert it directly into a percentage equals 60%. And that is our percent by mass of potassium bromide 
in, in a saturated solution. All right, same concept here. At zero degrees Celsius and at one atmosphere, as much as 0.7 grams of dioxygen, so oxygen gas, can dissolve in one liter of water. At zero degrees Celsius and at four atmospheres, how many grams of O2 dissolve in one liter of water? I've written this formula off to the side because this is a representation of solubility. This is some constant, the solubility constant, and this is your partial pressure. So let me rewrite this. This is moles per liter, and this is the solubility of our gas. K is our constant, so it'll be unitless. And PG equals uh, the partial pressure of our gas. So if we're given a mass, there's no mass in this equation, so we already know that we need to go from mass to moles. We're given 0.7 grams times 2 times 16.01 grams per one mole of O2 equals 0.7 divided by 0 0.021, we'll say 9 moles of O2, and that is going to be our CG value. So that's moles per liter. per liter of H2O. We need to solve for K. So how many grams of O2 can dissolve at four atmospheres? Uh, because, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, just making sure I'm not getting ahead of myself. So we have CG. Our partial pressure was one, or our pressure was one, rather. And we're solving for K. Yeah, we're trying to figure out K right now. So K equals solubility over pressure equals 0 0.0219 over 1. Is that right? So that is our constant. Now, we're looking for CG2 equals our constant times our pressure. And our pressure, in this case, is four atmosphere. K was the value that we just calculated. And our pressure is four. Simply multiply times four equals 0 0.0874. That'll be in moles per liter. I want to check something really quick. Okay, gas solubility tends to increase as the pressure of the gas increases. Makes sense. Okay, 
quantity of an ideal gas that dissolves in a definite volume of liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Just wanted to check my work there and make sure that I was leading you all down the right track here. Okay. Question 23. The Henry's law constant, that was that K, that value K we were calculating, for CO2 is 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2 molar per atmosphere at 25 degrees Celsius. Assuming ideal solution behavior, what pressure of carbon dioxide is needed to maintain a CO2 concentration of 0.1 molar in a can of lemon lime soda? Cool. So we were given our K value equals 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2 molar per atmosphere. Molar is moles per liter at 25 degrees Celsius. We're not dealing with any temperatures, changes in temperature. We're just dealing with a change in concentration. So Yeah, we can just set this up as an inequality again. So instead of CG equals K over PG, or times PG, we're solving for pressure. Yes. Yeah. We're going for 0.1 molar. We're dividing by 3.4 times 10 to the negative 2. We should get 2.9 atmosphere as our final answer. Colligative properties. <laughs> um, It's not super relevant to the problems that we're about to do. But a thing that was helpful for me to remember is that the colligative properties always expand the liquid phase. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what are the mole fractions of phosphoric acid and water? in a solution of 14.5 grams of phos phosphoric acid in 125 grams of water. First, outline the steps necessary to answer the question. We're asked for a mole fraction and then we're given masses. So we already know that we need to go from masses to moles. From there, we're going to determine the total moles. Total moles present. Steps three and four is going to be divide moles of solute by the total and divide moles of solvent by total moles. Answer the question. We're given 14.5 grams of phosphoric acid, which has a molar mass of around 98 grams. I'm, I'm doing kind of a hand wave here because we don't need the resolution on that. You guys can calculate the exact mole or the, the exact molar mass if you want to using your periodic table, or you will be given the molar mass. That equals 0.14 moles of phosphoric acid. We were given 125 grams of water, which has a molar mass of 18.02 grams, gives us 6.94 moles. 
We're going to sum those together. It gives us 7.08 moles total. And then we simply divide. So for our solute, the thing that was dissolved, we had 0 0.14 divided by 7.08 equals 0 0.02. And that is our molar ratio for phosphoric acid. Here we have 6.94 moles divided by the total equals 0 0.98 moles, and that is for H2O. So our molar ratio is 98% water and 2% phosphoric acid. All right, and last question. Cruising today. What is the molality of phosphoric acid in a solution of 14.5 grams of phosphoric acid in 125 grams of water? So the nice thing is we've already done some of the math here. We know how many moles are present. Outline the steps necessary to answer the question and answer the question. So first we need to talk about what molality is. Molality is different from molarity. Molality equals moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. When we were looking at our charts up above, this, this was really important because it was highlighting the impact that changes in temperature can have on your solubility. Molality is useful because it does not change with changes in temperature. So back to our steps. Convert mass of solute specifically to moles. Convert, here we just got to convert grams to kilograms. Should be straightforward. And our final step is to divide moles of solute. I am going to write that here. by kilograms of solvent. All right. So I'm just going to pull our moles of solute from up above. We have 0 0.14 moles of phosphoric acid. We were given 125 grams of water. That's simply one point. one to five kilograms of water. And that right there is our molality. 0.14 divided by 0.125 equals 1.12. And that's our practice for this week. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, week five is always an interesting week. Midterms are happening, um, or people are right between exams because that 10 week quarter goes pretty quick. So it's Friday. Take a deep breath. Enjoy your weekend. Have a nice break, and I will see you all next week. <laughs>